No, I caught the glass. I can't remember how that much about it, but uh, that's what we'll be doing this evening, looking at Paul's letter here. And the church at Philippi was uh, started, it was founded by the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey. And it was the first church established in Europe. Sometimes, you know, we don't think much about Europe when we're talking about the world of the time. We think Roman Empire, but Italy is also part of Europe as we know it today. And the Philippi was a small city. It was founded by King Philip of Macedonia, who had a rather famous son. Would anybody know who his, who his son was? Alexander the Great. So that's his, uh, and the greatest claim to fame of there was a battle was fought in 42 BC between the forces of Brutus and Cassius and those of Anthony and Octavian, later Caesar Augustus. Of course, when we're talking about Brutus and Cassius, we're talking about the time after Julius Caesar was uh, killed. Philippi became a Roman colony and a military outpost, and it had, because of that, they had special privileges. And when Paul's relationship, when he was in the city, he had a close and very cordial relationship with the people there, having helped him financially. Those people helped him financially at least two times before this letter was written. And having heard of his imprisonment in Rome, the church sent Epaphroditus with another gift. Now, uh, where have we heard the, word, the name Epaphroditus before? Anybody remember? That may be your assignment for next week if you don't. Okay, I'm not going to tell you right now. Make it yes. Anyway, Philippians is basically a thank you letter. He's thanking the Philippians for the gift that they sent. And it's uh, maybe one of the most personal letters that Paul ever wrote to a church family. Epaphroditus had become almost uh, fatally ill uh, while Paul was with, with Paul. And when he recovered, they sent him back. He sent them back with this letter. Though somewhat, somewhat obscured by Paul's gentleness in this letter, some of the problems of the church are actually seen. And even though it's a thank you letter, Paul says, well, he's very, well, he's very diplomatic, but he's going to talk about some problems too. And some of those things that are included are rivalries and personal ambition, the teaching of the Judaizers, perfectionism, and the influence of uh, Christians who believe the faith and divine grace about salvation, but they didn't think it was necessary to stand up for moral convictions and moral laws. So Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. It's one of the prison epistles. But some people have a disagreement on where he was when he wrote this letter. Uh, some think he was in Caesarea. Some people think he was in Ephesus. But undoubtedly, he was in Rome. In uh, verse 13 of the first chapter, Paul mentions the Praetoria. That's the Roman body of troops assigned to the emperor in Rome. It's also clear that in his trial that Paul's facing here, his life is at stake. Now, Paul is a Roman citizen, so that means that his trial had to be before Caesar in Rome. Although Paul was confined in Caesarea for two years, no final decision of his case was made while he was there. You read about that over in Acts chapter 24. Ephesus had been uh, suggested as a place of the writing on the basis of what's written in 1 Corinthians 15.32. But there's no clear reference in this passage to imprisonment. It says, And after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantageth it me? If the dead rise not, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. When they, people say, well, he fought beasts. He's talking about being in prison, but that's not what he's talking about there. And uh, to people, we, it's Rome. 
he wrote this, I'm, I'm going to be dogmatic. He was in prison in Rome. And one of the most important doctoral passages of, uh, in the New Testament of Philippians is over in chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, in which Paul gives the doctor, doctrine of kenosis. The self-humiliating, the emptying, self-emptying of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to this earth, he was always God. He just emptied himself of the glory that he had in heaven. We'll talk about that as we get over. And some of the important verses on prayer over in chapter 4. So with that little overview, we'll begin with verse 1, chapter 1 of Philippians. You know, Paul frequently began his letters with words of greeting, peace, commendation. Philippians is no exception whatsoever. And there's a tender tone of the entire letter. And it's apparent right from the very beginning. Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which were at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Now, Paul is the author's Gentile name, and of course, Saul was his Hebrew name. And it's interesting because Saul was his old life prior to conversion. After conversion, Paul is a new life. As an apostle to the Gentiles, he used his Gentile name. Galatians 2, 7 and 8, he says, But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So it's Paul. That's the name he uses from the point of conversion on. And he uses something here. He doesn't refer right away, you notice that, to his apostleship. He talks about Paul and Timothy. He and Timothy are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls them a servant of the Lord. Now, servant is the Greek word doulos. And he uses this pretty often in his letters. It's a slave who has been freed from his master and willingly returns to the master as a slave. And that's how Paul refers to himself, I have been freed, he was. He was freed from his sin on the road to Damascus. He was saved, but he is now returning to his master, Jesus Christ, and he's serving him. So that's what it means. Paul was a man released from his master to return willingly to serve him as a slave. And Paul was a willing servant of Jesus Christ, as was Timothy. Timothy had a special interest in the Philippian saints. As Paul says of Timothy in chapter 2, verse 20, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. That's a powerful statement about Timothy, isn't it? I have no man that has the same heart, the same feelings that I have for you people. That's Timothy. Timothy was associated with Paul in his imprisonment. We'll see that in chapter 2. But Timothy was not the co-author of this letter. Since he has spoken of it in the third person a couple of times here. You have to remember though that one of the marvelous things about the prison epistles of Paul or any of them, especially the prison epistles, he's dictating these letters to a scribe. He's going to be chained to a Roman guard. There are going to be visitors, people to and from, and he is dictating verbally to a scribe what we're reading today. So people are hearing the Word of God. That Roman soldier is hearing what God has to say. And when he calls the Philippian believers saints, Paul wasn't saying that the readers were sinless. There's an idea that the people have in this world forever, I guess. If you're a saint, you're perfect. No. If you're a saint, you're set aside for the purpose of God. Hagios. You're still a sinner, you're saved by grace. 
Hagians is simply those set apart. We've talked about it many times. You're set apart for the purpose of God. Those saints in Philippi were set apart for the purpose of God. God had a plan for them and a purpose. They were in Christ Jesus so far as their relationship to God was concerned, but they lived in Philippi. It's just like us. Experientially, we're here right now. We're in Montvale right now. But positionally, we're in heaven. And the Lord saves us there right now. That's the same situation with the Philippian believers. They were in Philippi. They were called to do something there to witness. But positionally, they were in heaven. And we see that Paul makes special mention of the bishops, that's the overseers, and the deacons. The deacons are the ones who do the work. Those are the ones who carry out different things. And that they were included all under the term, all the saints. As Miss Virginia would say, all means all. To you, Stuart, all the saints. This letter is to all the saints. I'm giving greeting to all you saints in Philippi. Therefore, we clearly see this letter was written to the believers in the church there. Paul had, like I said, had a special relationship with these people. But see, just belonging to a church doesn't make you a saint. You must be born again. As a matter of fact, the only way you can be a saint is to be born again. Now, I know that there are some religions out there that say you have to be dead 200 years and have so many miracles to your credit to be a saint. Not true. You're a saint the moment you accept Jesus Christ. The bishops or the overseers were also called elders over in Titus. And they were responsible for shepherding or pastoring the flock. Acts 20, 28 tells us this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. So when he talks about the bishop, he's talking about those who are teaching, those who are feeding the flock. The deacons were the church leaders who had special service responsibilities, simply. You remember the apostles were so busy, they needed someone to help them serve, serve the food. And that's where the deacons came from. And I told you it's going to be a little more in-depth than you may expect. Verse 2 says, Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In his greeting to the Philippians, Paul used two words descriptive of Christians. Grace and peace. That describes things nicely. The order in which he used them is also significant here. Before there can be any genuine peace, there must be a personal response to God's grace. A response to his unmerited favor. That's what grace means. And that was manifest to us at Calvary and on the Resurrection Sunday. Both grace and peace find their source in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace is the unmerited favor of God. Peace is the Greek, which means to be at one with. And we've talked about that before. Why aren't we at one with God now? Because of the rebellion that started in Eden. The moment that Adam sinned, that peace was broken. Now we can have peace with God again through Jesus Christ. Then there's a praise for their constant witness of the Philippian believers. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul was a prayer warrior. When he says, I thank my God about all remembrance of you, he could be walking down the road maybe laying in bed at night, and, and those Philippian believers come to his mind, to his heart, he prays for them. It must have brought Paul great joy when he, for what they had done to him, for the, how they had helped him. And the Philippians' hearts, you know, they, they were so open. And how often Paul thanked God 
for those Philippian believers. Here was a letter of commendation for one who was in Rome. He was in chains. He's 800 miles away. But his heart is in Philippi. About 10 years had passed now since Paul had first worked among those people there. But the passing of time hadn't diminished his love for them, his interest in them, and his prayers for them. Every time Paul thought about those Philippian believers, he thanked God. Four, verses 4, 5, and 6 says, Always in every prayer of mine, for you all, all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. None of those believers in Philippi were excluded from Paul's prayers. Always in every prayer of mine for all of you. You know, Paul probably is better than I am at remembering names. I bet Paul could sit down and name everyone in that church. I bet Paul never met a person he didn't remember. And he's praying for them. You know, coming from a prisoner, this is pretty significant, isn't it? You would think that he'd be all, oh, what, oh woe is me. I'm in prison. Uh, I'm facing a death sentence. And, but I'm always praying for you fellows. It was with joy that Paul also besought God on their behalf. Notice he says, making my request with joy. Prayer doesn't have to be something that's dreadful, painful. It should be joyous. You know, Paul's hardship made him better, not bitter. You know, a lot of times when we face hardships, we get bitter. We get downright nasty and mean sometimes. But Paul didn't get that away. It made him better. It made him more responsive to people's needs. The Philippian saints and Paul were partners in the things of Christ. And this is true because they shared with Paul his need. They felt for Paul. Now think about sending him a gift. 800 miles. You know, I would have loved to have gone out and preach for Wesley for the homecoming. But 400 miles was more than I could handle as an old man. And I have a car to drive. 800 miles? What a trip that would be. And yet they sent the needs to Paul. They gave of themselves to Paul. And in turn, to the cause of Christ for which they labored. But not only did they share with him in his need as a prisoner, that's not all they did. They also fellowshiped with him from the first day they trusted Jesus Christ. Even though they're that far apart, they still were so close they fellowshiped together. And that brought great joy to Paul's heart. Great confidence gripped Paul as he thought and prayed for the Philippians. Now, the perfect tense of the Greek word translated being confident indicates that Paul had come to a settled conviction earlier and that he was still confident it was true. Nothing has changed. Why was he so confident? What was he so sure of? It was that God would absolutely, without a doubt, continue to the completion of the good work that he had begun there. He knew that God was going to send others to proclaim the word. From in that church, they were going to continue to do things. The good work was their salvation. That's the best work there is. And God was going to continue to work. And it may also have included the, their fellowship and sharing of their bounties with Paul. You know, Paul had no doubt that God would continue in the Philippians, what he had begun to do there. God would work in them until the day of Jesus Christ. 
In 2.16, Paul called this the day of Christ. And Paul didn't know when that day would occur. And neither do we. When all believers will be called up to meet with the Lord in the air, uh, he didn't know that God would continue to work, that he had begun with his children, how long it was going to be. He didn't know. But don't let anybody ever tell you that Paul wasn't looking for Jesus Christ to come back in his lifetime. Verse 7 says, Even as it is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confidence of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. The first part of the verse is kind of like an apology or a defense for the way Paul felt about the Philippians as he expressed back in verses three through six. The Greek actually allows for the phrase, because I have you in my heart to read, since you have me in your heart. Either way, it's correct. You can read either way. Both, certainly both Paul and the Philippians were in each other's hearts. They loved each other. And it's something that's missing in the church today. Not loving each other. Of course, in this view of the specific reference to himself, it seems to accept better what we read here because I have you in my heart. But I like the fact it can be both ways. Paul said, I have you in my heart. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in the heart of Paul? His affection for the saints, he's also going to mention over in uh, verse 8 and over in chapter four, chapter 4. It didn't matter whether Paul was under arrest it says, in my bonds, that's what it means, or free. His friends at Philippi shared with him what God was doing through him. How encouraging could that be? To get, get a message from the Philippians that, boy, we're, we're doing things because of you, because of what you did here, because of what you taught, because of what you stand for. The work was primarily the spreading of the gospel. That's powerful. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's what Paul was doing. It had become you know, the partnership with him that they could spread God's grace. Paul gave them the gospel. They were saved. They were giving the gospel out to people. People were being saved. And Paul praised, praised them for their concern to spread the gospel abroad. They're not sitting back. They're not leaning back. They didn't have a church with recliners. They were working for the cause of Christ. Verse 8 says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Paul called on God to witness his feelings toward the Philippians. He said, God knows. Paul was aware and as well as his readers, this letter, that they could not know his heart. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. No one does. God has to testify. God knew Paul's heart perfectly. The affection Paul had for the Philippians was not a mere human interest or, or attraction. It originated in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's where the love came from. That's where it has to start with Jesus. Christ's love had so overwhelmed Paul that his affection was his very own. He loved them just as if Christ loved them. The fact that Paul told this to the Philippians demonstrated the reality and the intensity of his praise for them. So the apostle Paul then assured the saints that he prayed for them regularly. We saw that in verse 3. And now in verse 9, he reported what it was that he prayed for. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Pretty good prayer. It's Paul's prayer that the Philippians' love for other brethren would abound. That is, they would run over like you 
pour too much coffee in a cup. Or like a river over floods its banks when it rains a lot. That's what he's talking about here. He wants that love just to flow over a boundless. But love should be more though than sentimental. It should be knowledgeable and it should be discerning. Having genuine spiritual knowledge of God and all judgments, that is, in depth of insight into His ways, enables Christians to love God and others more. It has to be a growing thing, something that's more tomorrow than it was today. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So Paul states two purposes in his prayer. First is a near purpose. It's kind of like prophecy. A lot of times prophecy, there's a near fulfillment and then there's a distance fulfillment. First, the near purpose, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that is, to discern what is best. And secondly, it's a remote one, to be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Be pure and blameless, he says, until the Lord comes back. The idea of testing is clearly in view in the Greek word used here. It's translated approve, it means discern. A lot of times there's several different meanings to the word, but in this case, prove and discern means the same. The testing is with a view of approving something. The word was used in the Greek for testing metals and coins to determine whether they met specific standards. Oh, your love needs to meet specific standards. You need to approve things. You need to watch what you're doing. Sincere is a translation of a Greek word. It's the only used here and over in 2 Peter. It comes from the word son and the word to judge. So it's a hard one to really to bring over to English, but it would be, it indicates purity that is tested by the light of the sun. In other words, what you do, you do it in broad daylight. Paul wanted his readers to be rightly related to God and in fellowship with Him. Don't hide under a bushel basket. Be out there. Paul also was concerned that their relationships with others would be what God would have them to be. The word translated without offense, or blameless if you would, it, uh, it's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the same writer urged, give none offense. So Paul's desire for the, those at Philippi ought to be a concern for all believers to be morally pure and not causing any of them to stumble. And I'm going to stop there because we're approaching quitting time. We'll pick up, Lord willing, in verse 11.